I think this book talks about technology as a very positive tool um, that comes with one downside that which is it allows us to use it unconsciously. And when, when Americans are being asked about how much time they think they spend unconsciously with their devices, it's about 50% of their time. So if we're connected for over 12 hours, that's over six hours being spent unconsciously. If that was turned into uh, action, into, into um, alignment with ourselves, like one can be, become a millionaire in this country in a few years of six hours per day. Right, that that is the reality that we live in. So it's it, there's a a lot of wasted potential, and that wasted potential can be used for a lot of good. Zinni Ninkovic is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by One Point Five Media and Innovators Magazine. Sinny's family fled former Yugoslavia in 1992 and found refuge in Austria, where he quickly learned the most important skill of his life, adapting to new circumstances. Since then, Sinny received an MBA from UC Berkeley and helped companies like BMW, Lucid Motors, and Apple for 10 years to release new tech into the world. In 2019, Sidney left Apple as he realized that he needed to adapt once again, this time to a new reality in which digital technologies have been creating distractions that keep us away from realizing our dreams and full potential. He currently lives in San Francisco, where he wrote Untethered, and where he helps clients overcome distractions, create healthy habits, and achieve their dreams with the use of their devices. We are here to talk about Untethered and how to overcome distraction, build healthy digital habits, and reconnect with life. So this is Cindy's wonderful book. Uh, our, we have a, a few things in common. So my grandmother would, uh, was from Innsbruck, Austria. I, I have family there currently. I uh, haven't seen him much since the pandemic started, but Sinny actually grew up in, in Innsbruck and, and uh, we have that in common. He speaks German and English and is originally from uh, uh, Croatia and, and Bosnia and has all sorts of wonderful experiences, but uh, loves the English language, loves to help and communicate, kind of like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, kind of like me, English. Uh, English is my mother tongue, but actually German is my mother tongue. That's what I grew up. That's my mother spoke German. Welcome to the podcast, Cindy. It's so glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Well, it, you, you, you sent me your book, and uh, it's still not uh, out officially yet. The launch hasn't occurred yet. And you gave me an advanced copy to review kind of as a beta reviewer, as kind of podcast hosts do and, and people review to give you uh, some books. And it was actually through Goodreads. Goodreads is a good platform that I use a lot to review a lot of the books that I, that I read and people who I have on my podcast. And I really appreciate it. And I, I devoured it. I, I read it um, pretty quick, but I read all books kind of quick. And, and it, it was a good read, very timely, very necessary, uh, you know, talks a lot about the COVID and, and things in, in there. But I want to start a little bit earlier. So your background, uh, I, I touched upon a little bit in, in, in your biography, but you touch upon it quite a bit. It's your story. It's your, a lot, a lot of your life and your personal experiences or in the book, and you've not only been very fortunate in your upbringing, kind of a global citizen, so to say, a couple languages, traveling, and then fortunate, not only through your education and the jobs that you've had, the positions you've held and uh, companies you've advised and helped to really be at the cutting edge in, in many respects. I think uh, many people would cover what, what you've done and where you've been. All that, all that uh, wonderful experience, 
did it help you at all to weather this crazy time, pandemic, Black Lives Matters, people of color, just recently what's gone on with the, the Asian racism and violence that's, that has occurred, the craziness around the inauguration, um, you know, Brexit, I could go on and on, and especially the COVID lockdowns, pandemic, and and now we're kind of seeing slowly the world kind of emerging out, out of that. Did, did any of that experience, that past knowledge, that wisdom around tech and around things help you? Or did it actually make what we'll go into next, this addiction with technology worse? Was it like now you're forced into the tech even more? Yeah, those are great questions, Mark. Um, uh, well, well, to start off, I would say, there are two main experiences that have helped me, or at least changed my perspective on this pandemic. Um, one of them is certainly uh, coming to Austria as a refugee, right? And having to start in Austria, learning a new language, uh, learning a new culture, um, establishing a new way of life that we weren't used to as a family. And so what, what I learned there is obviously adjusting to new circumstances, but also the value of looking into the future. Right, because uh, when you come to a new country as a refugee, and and you, th there is a natural inclination to um, give into sadness, right? Because you just lost so much. You lost everything that, for my parents especially, everything that they worked for for thirty five years of life was lost within of a couple of months. Um, so it's easy to fall into sadness, but I think there, what what my family did really well, and that that's what they taught me was to like look forward. And, and see what's ahead rather than look into the sadness of the, of the recent past. Um, and during COVID, that was also extremely helpful. So I think the first month uh, around March, April, that was, uh, that was a tough month because um, I, I felt the, the, the energies around me, it, it was hard for a lot of people. Um, and so even though I personally didn't suffer too much at that point. I've already given up my job at Apple. I've already faced a new reality for myself. Um, so it, it wasn't the hardest month of my life personally, but a lot of people were struggling. And so um, with, with that, I had a lot of friends that were calling me and, and, and obviously my family as well. So it, it was hard from that perspective, but not necessarily in, in terms of adjusting to new circumstances. Um, I think growing up in the ways that I did helped me to actually create the best out of this crisis for uh, myself, my family, and some of my friends. Uh, as a few examples, early in the crisis, I decided to uh, spend some time in, in places I've never visited before because I realized that, well, if nobody is traveling, there won't be any tourists, meaning wherever I go, I'm going to have the most local experience I will ever get in my entire life. Right, and so I decided to spend a few months living in Portugal. Um, I did experience a very different culture there that um, I, I enjoyed a lot, and spent a few months living in Taiwan, which was one of those countries that uh, was able to combat COVID in in phenomenal ways. Um, meaning, while I was there, I hardly felt any effects from COVID. Um, everything was open, restaurants were open, bars were open. Um, it was a pretty normal life over there. So I had. I had the advantage that I could live on three different continents during this pandemic and really experience how uh, cu culture is affected by COVID. Um, and that was, that was just super fascinating. Now, th so that, that's the first experience from my childhood that kind of allowed me to just look into the future and, and adjust um, my needs and desires during this time. So I, I traveled a lot actually on mostly empty airplanes and experienced uh, local cultures in ways that will probably never be able to again. Um, the other experience is obviously the, the side of tech dependency and tech overuse. And I think that uh, had quite a negative effect in the beginning, because as, as you know, I talk about this in my book about the effects of uh, the neg negative media bias, meaning um, there is a big incentive for media to report articles that are highly negatively biased. Um, and, and that showed up in March and April like no other time before. I mean, it was impossible to open a news channel without hearing about people dying and how it's going to affect us all and, and how bad the future is and what's going to happen to the stock market. So it was really hard to uh, flee from that. And 
And at the same time, I was living with uh, a few people. And so we kind of rallied each other together into, into states of consciousness that weren't necessarily beneficial to us in, in this first month. So I think tech um, added to this crisis to a certain degree by, um, by making this news easier available to us, by uh, allowing us to wake up to notifications of negativity, right? And uh, so I don't, I don't necessarily think tech helped me through the crisis as much as uh, these childhood experiences did. Now, obviously, on the positive side of things, uh, we have amazing developers out there who developed software like Zoom that allows us to still connect like we're connecting right now um, and still have a certain degree of human experience. So I think without technology, on the other hand, the crisis might have been much, much harder on all of us uh, as we were would not have been able to keep up that social contact in such an easy way. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> Taiwan is, is a, a beautiful place, a wonderful, um, very advanced uh, civilization. You kind of touch about on Taiwan, kind of closer toward the end of the book. And um, I had I actually had Audrey Tang, the digital minister of Taiwan, on, on the podcast and did a lot to help Taiwan and, and many the other uh, social and governmental structures there helped a lot as well as an advanced society but you also touch upon that you know taiwan wasn't always such a place that uh, uh, dealt a lot with the garbage and litter and recycling issues and and wasn't the best place in the world to live but now it's a, a totally uh, amazing place to live very advanced and um there's one caveat that comes to that is broadband is a human right in Taiwan. And what we're going to get into now is you actually started out with some addictions and probably still have some lingering addictions to technology um, that created some pretty big issues, I guess, in, in your life that that made this realization, hey, I've, I've got to change. I've got to make this shift. I've got to really control figure out how to use it for the good and, and not have it be my kryptonite, as, as you mentioned in right. the book as well, so to say, and how, how can I use it for, for the good? So now you're going to a place that's pr probably got five to 10 times better broadband than the US and, and Europe and different places and mm -hmm. everything's connected. They're still open, the, the bars, the clubs, the concerts, the events, the baseball, and, and that that was fine. It, you, you didn't have any problem, or, or did you did you notice? Okay, now I've really got to be disciplined. Or how, how was that like? Uh, explain that to me. Yeah, what I think was interesting experiencing Taiwan during the crisis was not only the advanced civilization that you're mentioning, which is it's truly incredible at what level they are from a, a societal perspective, but also from a technological perspective, like. The, the systems just interact with each other. As, as a simple example, um, when I picked up my visa there, I, I uh, went to their visa office and um, there was an information stand at the entrance and I just asked, hey, uh, you know, I have this type of visa, where could I pick it up? And the person literally told me, wait a minute, sir, and came back with my card within one minute. That's how like well the systems are connected. To, all, all they needed to do is look up my name, and within one minute I had a card. And and this trickles down through the entire society, where the uh, the underground card can be used at grocery stores to buy groceries. So, so all systems are just um, connected with each other, and so is their society. Um, experiencing Taiwan during the crisis um, made my personal technology use change, and and it made me realize that when everything is open, what I focus on in my technology use is the social perspective, meaning social media, social networks, um, connecting over WhatsApp Messenger and all the, the other apps that allow us to connect with each other. Um, while during COVID, that was uh, less of my focus. During COVID, the, the problem applications were Netflix, YouTube, um, entertainment applications that allow us to escape from the realities that weren't always positive during those times. Um, and so it was more, more of a shift rather than necessarily a change in the overall usage. It was, it was a shift in apps that I've experienced during that time. Um, personally, I think that 
each one of us has a different problem app, right? We, we all love different things. For some, it's uh, Kindle, right? They love reading books and they just can't, uh, can't close their Kindle application. For other, it's YouTube. I, I just love motion picture. And so videos work really well for me as an educational material, but also as a material of uh, dependency to a certain degree. Um, and for others, it's, it's social media, right? Especially for teenagers, that seems to be a huge issue. Yeah, that, that's a nice insight. And, and it really transitions nicely to kind of some, some other questions I want to draw out of you, but also how they tie to the book. During this time of the pandemic, the lockdown, all, all this craziness, we've seen a lot of a strong rise of nationalism, a lot of uh, racism, problems around race as well, and uh, really uh, nationalistic views. In some respects, that's okay because we kind of go back to our home and, and kind of get localized and say, okay, we need to make sure we're all taken care of here in our local areas. But in other respects, it's a really horrific things can happen and, and it can go awry. Um, being in Taiwan, Taiwan was one of the first to kind of recognize through their technology, through those innovations, okay, the, there's a doctor in Wuhan. He's saying, okay, there's, we need to be aware of this. And he was, he was kind of facing going to, going to jail or to prison and, and some, some big issues by even mentioning it. But they have this upvoting system in Taiwan that quickly recognized that what he was saying was accurate so that they could lock down. And I believe in some respects, they were probably already wearing masks similar to like in Thailand and Bangkok and other places in Asia because of the air pollution, because the air pollution is kind of bad in, in some of those places. Um, so and there's an they, element of respect as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I think in, in Asia, what's fascinating to me, wearing a mask is a sign of respect um, and awareness, meaning uh, I am aware that I am currently sick, might be just a, a little cough, might be a flu, I don't know, but what I can do to protect others around me is to wear a mask. And I, I find that uh, that voluntary giving up of, of uh, some little freedoms um, is, is fascinating to, to protect others. I, I love it. And I, I do too. I go to Asia quite a bit, ma mainly Thailand and um, uh, Singapore. But mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, matter of fact, during the, during the same time, I was supposed to go to Kuala Lumpur and uh, Japan and, and uh, Thailand again, and, and it was just canceled. Um, the, yeah. Where I'm kind of going is with, with this nationalism and, and things that are going on, mm -hmm. Uh, and how that ties to technology and how um, through having kind of a, uh, a, a digital ecosystem or a digital twin of the earth and having technology that offers broad, uh, broadband as a human right and kind of having those tools, uh, there are some true benefits and true, true things that really help. But on, on the flip side, there's some things that really can uh, lead us awry. Fake news is one you mentioned, misinformation um, and, and things like that that, that occur. Um, and this ties to, to now a bigger question. Do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without divisions of humanity one from another, without nations, without borders, without these divisions, you yourself had a journey as a type of a refugee that made it to the U.S. Um, and how did it make you feel during these times? But how do you feel about it in general, where we're moving forward in the future, especially now that there's in the past few years, there's a lot of talk about potential dig digital politicians, digital ambassadors, kind of this new digital governance and and things with emerging technologies. Tell us a little bit how you feel about that and also how you address that in your book. Sure. Um, well, those are big questions, Mark. Not sure I have an answer to all of them, but um, well, my thoughts on the first one is uh, demonizing technology is something that we should be really uh, aware of as a, um, it has a lot of potential downsides if we start demonizing technology. Being realistic, technology, uh, especially the smartphone, was a 
revolution. We're talking about an iPhone that came out in 2007 with the App Store, I think in 2008. So talking about 12, 13, 14 years of having the smartphone and how did it change our lives? It changed our lives in ways where 97% uh, of Americans can't even imagine walking outside without their smartphone. Like that is something that happened over a good decade. It's, it's incredible change. And there is a reason why we love our smartphones so much because the utility is, is more powerful than any other tool has ever provided before in, in humanity's history. Uh, there was no single time where an individual user had so much power in their hands. Um, so that's something that we should cherish. I'm, I love technology. I love my smartphone. I think those are the best tools we have ever developed. So um, let's not demonize them uh, from the beginning. There are some disadvantages with, with power always comes responsibility. And so we have to be aware that these tools have some uh, negative aspects to them. For example, um, as I spoke in the Taiwan chapter, convenience is not always helpful to us. Right? Some of the conveniences our smartphones provide are actually acting against our interest. Um, the complexity, the negative media bias, um, the extractive algorithms, those are just some, some negative perspectives to technology that we have to be aware of. And so in my, I book, in my book, I talk a lot about awareness and how we can bring that back to technology use. Um, so that's, that's the first point I wanted to make. Let's not demonize technology. Let's not demonize tech companies. Um, obviously, they don't always act in our best interest because they, at the end of the day, are within of a capitalist system. So profit, in, uh, profit incentives are there for these companies as well. Um, but when we look at tech companies, we could also say, what other uh, industry is interested in self-regulating uh, themselves in ways where they actually provide us with tools that allows us to use technology less, right? Um, Apple provides us uh, the screen time tools that allow us to see, okay, I'm using this app for that many hours and this app for this many hours. I can set limits. Um, I don't know of other industries who are willing to uh, allow their users to uh, visit them less often. You know, so there, there are some good, good sides to what uh, tech companies are doing. And so I don't want to demonize them because demonizing has a political perspective to it as well. And that's the second point that I wanted to make, um, you know, the social dilemma, for example, a documentary that has been seen by, I think, over 100 million households at this point, it really, it really made a huge splash around the world. When I was visiting Taiwan, people knew about it. When I was in, in Portugal, people knew and heard about it. So um, I have a lot of respect for Tristan Harris, who put out this documentary and, and, and his life's work to help us understand what's really going on. Um, at the same time, I think demonizing technology has this political perspective to it. I, I remember one week after watching The Social Dilemma, I, I turned uh, on Fox News and I heard the same talking points that I've heard in The Social Dilemma, but turned against the uh, original intention. Uh, they, they made a comment like, the liberal tech companies are using our attention against us. And so we need to develop conservative media that is telling us the actual truth. Right. Um, and so that's the kind of political downside of demonizing technologies, which, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, liberal tech companies are not necessarily biasing our opinions in, in liberal ways. That's at least not what I found in, in studies necessarily. Um, so, yeah, that's the second point that I wanted to make. And uh, let me see if there was a third point. Because the I global know citizenship, talking. global citizenry, globalization kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the third point. So what's interesting to me is that we spend a couple de decades uh, going towards globalization. And I think on a political spectrum, we were first able to see, oh, wait a second, not everybody is sitting on the same train, right? There are nationalist movements that are showing us not everybody is on board with globalization. Not everybody wants to uh, to give up some of their cultural elements uh, to fit into a wider global structure. And now on a technological perspective, I think we're seeing similar developments of decentralization. Cryptocurrency is, is a great example of decentralization uh, because at the core of its technology is decentralization, but also the way we use messaging apps uh, is proving to become more decentralized, meaning 
uh, WhatsApp, Telegram groups, for example, um, are being used as local communities to develop local community around different interests, uh, rather than having a shared platform uh, where, where all of us are getting the same information, people seem more and more interested to develop their own little groups. And so there is, while we are moving towards globalization and a unification of culture globally, um, there is also this, this, this movement which feels very human of uh, building your own little tribe around you, right? So in, in a gist, you are saying you are a global citizen you feel good about that how would you feel about a world without borders divisions of humanity mm -hmm. one from another mm. i mean uh, part of part of your answer as well uh when i went in the question because you went back to taiwan and portugal during uh, the beginning of a pandemic where most people say okay we got to stay we're not traveling you know as you said, ah, oh, it's a perfect opportunity to learn new cultures, experience new things and travel. And, and it worked out very well for you. Um, but I think it, just in that action, it seems like there's some kind of answer there as well of how, how you view the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I personally think we should be able to travel wherever we want to travel to and experience other cultures. The, the main reason for that being is... Uh, experiencing other cultures, whether that's within of the US or outside the country, uh, gives us a new perspective. Um, I, I know that for myself, uh, having lived on different continents, experienced different countries as, as a local, has given me a completely different perspective on the world. And, and I've definitely become more liberal through that perspective because there is a understanding that's being developed of why the culture is behaving in a certain way, why certain people are behaving in the ways that they are. I think that understanding is really hard to, uh, to come to when one is enclosed in the environment that we spend our every days in, right? So, so traveling from that perspective is, is, I think, one of the most unifying forces uh, that exists. Um, the, around the question, should there be borders or not, that's a hard one for me to answer. I don't think I'm like politically savvy enough to answer a question like that. But personally, uh, being able to travel everywhere, I think that's important for us. Whether we should be allowed to live anywhere, that's a political question that's hard to answer. And, and I think the, you know, the, the right wing and left wing sides have probably split on answering that question. Um, I don't know what the right answer to it is. I've obviously profited myself from being allowed to come to Austria and grow up in Austria as a refugee. So I think there's a lot of value to refugee programs uh, when, when countries are unstable. Um, and there's a lot of value to visiting every country in the world. Does it make sense to allow all of us to live anywhere? That's a big question I'm not quite able to answer. I, I wish I could from a personal perspective, but if it makes sense on a political uh, level, I'm not sure. Uh, thanks for being honest with me, and I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, the the real uh, the real reason behind it is during the pandemic, um, where you know most humanity was locked down, kept behind their borders, but air, water, food, um, global trade was still moving. The pandemic obviously continued to move exponentially around the world. Uh, species moved without borders, but humanity didn't. And it, we saw some real ripple effects of what some of the causes of that, uh, that restriction or that uh, type of really um, lack of movement. And, and I'm also kind of, there, there's, a, there's a bigger point to that. And that is, we're all crew members on this spaceship Earth. And we're, none of us are really passengers. We're all kind of have our hand on the steering wheel, can guide our future and our destiny, and are, are on this course to kind of guide where, where we're going. And, um, you know, there's maybe babies and maybe the elderly right, right before they pass away are uh, considered passengers, but they're passengers who usually teach other humans 
how to be better crew members and, and give them, you know, better stewardship over not only other humans, but our planet. And so I, I wanted to kind of get your views on that because now I'm going to, I'm going to go back to even the beginning. I have some few questions for you before we dive even deeper in the book. I want to know, so you're, once the book launches, you're going to have seven day courses on, on tips, tools, tricks, how to untether uh, that anyone can use. And uh, um, especially you, you discuss this as well, kind of parents, uh, because there's some complexities, children, parents, you know, and, and managing lifestyle, work, life balance, things like that, that uh, it can be get into that complexity that you talk about. But I really want to know, who is the book for? What's your audience? Did you, before you started, say, this is my audience? Or is this any, anybody who has a smartphone or a device in their surroundings? Can, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so originally, when I started writing the book, uh, I was focused on um, a teenager to young adult, because I think that they experience technology from a very um, unique perspective. So until the age of, let's say, 22, we're typically, many of us are stuck in educational institutions, stuck in a positive way as much as in a negative way, but um, our perspective around how we use technology is very tight to that environment. And that environment is focused on learning and socializing. Those are the two perspectives of educational environments. And so social media is... Um, social media and social media networks are influencing them in ways that they're not for most of us because we use technology beyond those two perspectives, right? Um, we can see that in data as well. Um, Canada is, is, is amazing in how much data it collects um, about their elementary school and, and middle school children. And one of the pieces uh, of, of data is uh, in, I think it's in the state of I'm not sure. I think it's in Ontario, if I remember correctly. Uh, there, there is an interesting survey that is conducted every two years where they ask middle school uh, children about their mental health, their physical health, and how that is correlated to their technology use. And so over the over 2017 to 2019, they did this survey, and I kind of looked into it to, to understand what is changing. And there is this very clear correlation between screen time and physical health and mental health that can be this, the, uh, that can be analyzed out of out of those two surveys. So, for example, with with a twenty percent of screen time, uh, physical health issues increased by about twenty to twenty five percent. Mental health issues increased by twenty to twenty five percent. Loneliness increases by the same number, and and depression increases by the same number. So, obviously, uh, I can't infer causation from those surveys, but it, it, it is pretty clear that we, when we inc increase screen time uh, with, with youth, it leads to uh, more feelings of loneliness, although they spend so much time on social media networks. Um, it increases depression rates, it increases physical health issues. So um, that was surprising to me initially when I saw it. I was surprised by the loneliness crisis that is actually caused by screen time, although it allows us to connect more. Um, so, so that that was that was fascinating for me to to figure out. And I think uh, from that perspective, technology is obviously uh, for youth not only a way of connecting, but it's also a way of disconnecting from themselves and others, seemingly so. Um, and so that's why I wanted to focus my book specifically on a younger generation that is. Uh, just coming out of educational institutions that will broaden the ways that they're using technology coming out of it, but also um, I'm hoping with the book to provide them a perspective um, on the experiences that they have and hopefully the experiences that they might have in future with technology so they can place themselves and their usage uh, in a way that actually serves the their future needs. So um... I don't know if you're the millennial group, but you're uh, you're around 33, 34. Uh, you mentioned it in the book. And um, so a question that came up in my readings and, and before we get into kind of some of the struggles you had and, and the transitions growing up, my constant thought is you definitely a younger generation. I struggle to reach that gen younger generation. So when... Um, 
I'm asked to speak or uh, address those groups. It's like, okay, you have 10 minutes to tell us how to save the world. You have 15 minutes of TED Talk to tell us how to save the world. And it's just extremely difficult, but it's also dependent on how, you know, Ted says, Ted Talks will work around 15 minutes and the screen time and these TikTok versions and the YouTube, the shorts and, and those things work the best to capture the attention and to, to, to feed that, which we'll talk that uh, uh, gets into as well as the social dilemma spoke about that as well. Yep. Um, and so I, I'm, as I'm reading this, I get this entire feeling throughout the book that it really is kind of for that audience. But I'm saying, I don't know a lot in, in that, that group that read big books, that read, you know, a biblical book of um, Yuval Noah Harari or, you know, uh, uh, Vaclav Smil or whoever else that, that is like that. And so um, how do you capture that audience or how are they reading how do we get them to to get this great wisdom that you're dealing with and have you thought about that um besides the story of your journey that you take them on to a certain point and then you say okay this is what i dealt with maybe you'll deal with some of the similar and now here's the tips to get out of that or to use to to take take control i'm just almost worried that they, they, you know they're like oh my gosh what you know this is a book this is longer than a minute, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, those are great points. Um, I mean, Mark, you're speaking to my biggest worry from the beginning of writing this book. I was like, Sini, why are you writing a book? This is not the audience of, of, of book readers. They're a different audience, they're a different generation. The way they, they um, consume information, it has just changed so much. The speed of information how quickly we need to get to the point. And a book is not that format. So I am actually developing, well, well first of all, the, the book can and, and should be read by, but read by people outside of that generation, certainly. So I'm, I'm happy that, that you were one of the readers. And I think it is useful for truly anybody who has a smartphone and feels dependency from time to time. That being said, my desire is, is to help the youth the most um, and parents, because I think they have, uh, they have pains that that others might not be feeling uh, through technology. Um, now, th that being said, I think uh, when I started writing the book, I was aware that, OK, this book might not be bought primarily by uh, young people because they consume information differently. But it was also a tool for me to uh, really understand what tools are out there, what is happening to us. And I think a, a book for the author is as much a learning experience as it is hopefully for the reader. And it was certainly for me. And so as the second step in my journey, I'm developing tools and, and courses that are more available to that generation. So for example, the seven day course you, you shortly spoke about is one hour a day for seven days. So that's a, a total of seven hours over a week that is life interaction with the audience. Um, that hopefully, and that's the goal of the course, helps us save one hour in our day after just seven days. Um, that's the first step. Another step I'm working on right now is actually the, the nine tools, the nine tool frameworks that I'm presenting in the book. Um, I'm actually distilling them down to a few pages, and I will be posting them on my website for free so that... Uh, you know, younger readers who are interested in, in getting the core information and getting it right now have, have a chance to do so in, in ways that are accessible to them. Um, whether I will be doing TikTok videos in future, I'm not sure yet. I personally love TikTok. I think it's a great platform. Um, I'm actually subscribed to a couple of psychologists on there who deliver um, really amazing insights about human nature within a one minute. So it is very useful information. Um, so maybe I will pick up on that as well. But for it's now, also uh, highly addictive. Highly <laughs> addictive. It is true. It is true. Uh, uh, so we both know Tristan Harris uh, for the Center for Humane Technology. And last time I saw him was in, in Davos. Um, he was speaking at the SDG Cities uh, event. And then afterwards, uh, out in the lobby of the hotel, we had a discussion. And you, you mentioned in the book, he came over to your house and you kind of know about what he does. You've watched The Social Dilemma. You talk about that. I, I, I really think that 
their, uh, the tools that you give in the book and, and that, that is perfect. I was really thinking that, um, be, how, how do you reach these audience? That's why I brought you that question. And so I, I, luckily over the weekend, while I was reading your book, I uh, was at uh, a good friend of mine's house who has three children. They're all uh, teens and below. So kind of uh, grade school and, and junior high school age. And all, all of them have technology addiction. All of them have not smartphone, iPads, computers, gaming addiction. But when it comes to their homework now, for a long time, Germany's been in lockdown. So there's been kind of the homeschooling, but done through Zoom, through online, uh, Skype, what, whatever formats that they use. Um, so now they're even diving deeper into that. And the parents were saying they have, they're struggling to distinguish, are they doing homework? Are they interacting with their class and doing that? Or are they gaming or doing something else? And it just kind of, it's a, it's a blending. And that there was some book reading requirements and they were saying, well, we purchased, he had the ebook or the dig PDF version of the book, but we purchased an audible, an audio version of that. And, and that seems to work very well, which I've gotten a lot of feedback and audio version of the book. Yep. But then also these type of a cliff notes, shorter versions like Blinkist and uh, I can't think of the other company's name that kind of take the shorter version of your book. And I, 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 for me, it's hard because it's like you've spent all this time, this work, this research, and, and a really master work, a great book and read. And, and then, you know, people are like, give me the short version, give me the elevator per pitch, just tell me the five things or nine things I need to know. Yep. And then, okay, thanks. I got it. You know, and yep. um, eventually you, we can get, get them hooked in the same way as digital on reading. And that's where I kind of want to go into this now with you. And, and that is, is in the beginning, you really start out, you say, man, I had some addictions and I lost some money and, and, um, uh, and it really started out with gaming. You were, you were gaming uh, as in Innsbruck, or was that already where you already had left Innsbruck? Yeah. No, that was back in Innsbruck. So um, I, I think it was about 12 years old uh, when when StarCraft came out, which is the, the kind of uh, the, the chess of computer games in, to a certain degree. It's, it's one of the most strategic games that has survived until now. We still see tournaments in 2021, over 20 years later after that game came out. Um, so StarCraft was my first love as a gamer, um, but I've, I've soon realized that games have just over the years become progressively better, right? Not only better at, in terms of graphics and, and resolution or gameplay, they've also become better in uh, understanding what keeps us engaged. And, and now in Silicon Valley, we use this, this term gamification uh, quite a bit to figure out how to keep people on our platforms more, more often and for longer periods of time. And that's because games were the first one to figure out how to do that. Um, because obviously gamers are in this enclosed system for hours and every click is monitored. So it's easy for, for gaming companies to track uh, what gamers are doing. And, and for me, at some point, I, I felt like I spent more time gaming that I was in school, then I played sports, although sports was probably my second love. Um, gaming to at some point became my first love. And in, in the book, I'm sharing the story around um, how at some point uh, after playing for 72 hours at a land party, I, I was close to being in an in a accident uh, because, because of it and, and could have easily lost my life that day. Um, but this this I obviously realized for myself at some point that uh, the gaming had to stop in order for my life to start to a certain degree. Um, and there's another story in the book that I'm sharing around how that happened. But I think what's what's more important is that even as somebody who is is consciously aware of what happened to him, um, the apps that are coming out now are still uh, hooking me into certain experiences that I didn't expect. Uh, one of those stories that I'm obviously sharing is, is the time that, where I lost $100,000 uh, because of, uh, mainly because of Robinhood, honestly, uh, the investment app that became so popular over the past three, four years. 
and uh, you know, I'm I'm not obviously the only person who has experienced that. Uh, there is an unfortunate story uh, of a of a young trader on Robinhood who um, who allegedly lost multiple hundred thousand dollars. Turns out it was a technical error, um, and unfortunately, the young man took his life because of that technical error. So uh, there are real life consequences to us being uh, gamified into experiences that shouldn't be gamified. There is a reason why financial, why the financial industry is one of the most regulated industries out there, because we don't want people to waste their life savings away because they, uh, they feel like it's a game, right? And, and that's unfortunately happening to a lot of people and has happened to, to a lot of people uh, over the past few years. Um, and as personal finance has become this huge topic uh, with, with cryptocurrency gaining popularity, I think it's, it's more important than ever to look at the uh, applications that are keeping us engaged with those uh, financial assets. And if that's, if that's truly how we want to spend, be spending our time and be spending our money at the end of the day. You're definitely not alone. I believe there's millions of people on our planet who have an addiction, who have a problem. Um, most people don't know this. I did a podcast uh, uh, with an app developer, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Stephanie Paler Palermo, Palermo. And um, she did an app called Queen Rules. And uh, I, because our podcast, I tested it out and I've, I've got the worst addictive personality. I had to play it till the end mm -hmm. and finish it, but that goes way back. So I have what's called techno lust. I've had it my whole life. So I, I was one of the first on the internet. Uh, I had one of the first computers, a big IBM data card and big uh, tape drive computers and just have always been programming, coding and, and really ad uh, addicted to technology. Mm -hmm. And then my first games were, you know, the old Sim Cities, and then the Age of Empires. And then I, I actually played. I, I have children, so I have a, a, a son. He's just had a baby. Um, his wife just had a baby, and he and I used to play StarCraft. So I know exactly what you mean. And we loved it. We were, we were addicted, and uh, did our own clans and all, all sorts of stuff. So I, I love, right. I love the game and. And it is very addictive, but I, I'm one who um, I used to um, uh, years back, decades ago, <laughs> used to uh, work these weird rotation shifts, different hours, and I'd get off work and go home, turn on the computer and start playing these games. And all of a sudden I'd have to sleep so that I could go back to the next shift of work and um all of a sudden be like four or five in the evening. And I just hadn't gone to sleep yet, but I had to go to work in a few hours. And that's how addictive it really is. And I know how it is. I, you know, when I said TikTok's addictive, I know how that is. There's some amazing um, content on there, but there's also this thing that you just can't stop consuming in your right. next thing, hour, two hours. And you really talk about that and, and go into Mm -hmm. kind of how and why how it happened to you and what you experienced but what the research and trends and data not only from Tristan Harris and and that and, and then you, you later in the in the book bring up some tools from like Tim Ferriss and and many others on how we can manage our time how we can have those four-hour work weeks and those those times those those pockets of efficiency where we're not uh, giving away all our life to technology and neglecting, you know, things that we need to do. Um, in, in the book, you really talk a lot about getting help from your friends and checking in and making sure they keep you on track with your time and you keep them on track with their time. How does that, does that really work? The, does it really work? Is it because you're a different generation? I, I don't know. I think uh, I have, I struggle with that. I'd like to know more yeah. on some of those tips and how you do that. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So, so uh, before I talk about the tools, maybe uh, one mention around addiction. And I, I don't know if you've noticed that in the book, but I, I try to stay away from the word addiction as much as possible. Um, and the reason is that a lot of our habits feel addictive, but from a, a physiological perspective, 
it's it's hard for even scientists to say like is this a true addiction uh, like like a substance addiction is um or is this more uh bad habits that we need to get out of and so i, I talk a lot about some dependencies and over usage but uh, I, I try in my book to not mention the word addiction too much because I'm not sure and, and a lot of scientists don't seem to be quite sure yet whether we can talk about technology as being uh, a true addiction uh, the way that is defined by science these days. So th that's just something that I wanted to point out because I think, uh, you know, in I'm society we did. use the word addiction um, and, and somebody who has experienced true substance addiction for them technology might not be addictive uh, in, in that in the truest sense of, of that word. So just wanted to put, put that out there uh, before talking about tools. Um, I talk about social responsibility a lot in, in my tools. And the reason is that especially the youngest generation is, they, they, they are so tied to each other through different groups right through through the decentralized platforms that they're using um, that they spend significantly more time with other people in virtual rooms than they actually spend with themselves by themselves um, reading doing whatever is needed to develop themselves significantly more time right we're talking about a one to five one to six ratio and so if 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 they're so used to being with each other already um, why not take advantage of, of something that they're used to, a habit that they already have, and turn that habit into something useful? And so in my book, I talk about, uh, in, in a chapter called Repeat, I talk about the two main tools that I use to stay accountable to myself and, and my future self, mainly. Uh, one of them is I love using my calendar and I schedule appointments with myself in my calendar, which is something that I think many more people should should do. Um, I have one hour per day in there that is my quiet hour where I don't spend time with technology, but I spend time with myself um, to kind of recenter and refocus on my own needs. But the the other tool that I that I love sharing and it, it is it is so powerful. Um, I talked to a friend of mine recently who started a habit course a couple of months ago and the number one tool that helped his his clients develop healthy habits was accountability with each other, right? And he, he talks about that as well in his course. So um, for me, the number one tool that I use on a, on a daily basis is I work with other people to make their goals happen and they work with me to make my goals happen. And that happens in very simple sessions. So every day I have about one or two of those sessions where uh, we jump on a Zoom call like this one and I tell my friend what I'm about to do for the next hour, and they tell me what they're about to do for the next hour, and then we do our work together. And I'm accountable. I'm I'm making sure that he's doing his work or she's doing her work, and they're accountable that I'm doing my work. And and the reason why it works so well is is actually quite simple, and it's scientifically proven as well. Um, so when we think about uh, doctors who prescribe a certain medication. Uh, the likelihood that we will actually use that medication on ourselves is about 70%, meaning 70% of people uh, consume the prescribed medication for them. Now, if, if our pet is sick and a doctor of a, a vet prescribes certain medication to them, 92% of people are uh, buying and giving that medication to their pets. So even if it's not another human, even if it's just our pet, uh, we are significantly more likely to help them get better than we are to help ourselves get better. And so the likelihood of me doing my work when I'm by myself is lower than the likelihood of me doing my work if somebody else uh, is, is making sure that I am doing my work, but, but also if I'm making sure that they're doing their work, because being helpful is something that we humans strive for everybody desires to to help others it makes us feel good and so creating a situation where we are we are uh, more likely to feel good about the work that we're doing is is something that is extremely useful um and uh, i i can't imagine i can't imagine uh, to to spend a week without accountability at this point it's just the most efficient 
or effective tool that I've ever used. And you see that accountability. I, I also like that chapter, by the way, repeat and, and um, how you discuss um, that and a few other nice things in the chapter. I think it's very efficient to build a new habit, to build positive habits and, and also um, kind of shows how easy it is to change habits. I guess the question is, do, do you feel or have you in your journey at all felt like you've been pushed in to back another punching in and out at a work some uh, micromanaged on your time like you feel okay now I feel like my parents are asking me to do my homework or read the book or my employers ask me to punch in punch out for lunch punch out for break and and that this this constant micromanagement of one's life is it much different than that um well, I think it's significantly different because because micromanagement is is a felt experience that we have when uh, somebody else manages our time uh, without alignment with our own needs, right? That's when we experience to be micromanaged when um, you know when uh, my my partner and I talk about uh, how to structure our days and we align that with our needs. Then it never feels feels micromanaged. It feels great to have alignment with another person. And, and similar with accountability, to me, it has never felt like micromanagement. It actually feels very liberating because I know some, there's somebody who actually cares uh, for me doing the work that matters to me, right? They're, they're not profiting from this work in any other way than feeling good about their achievements or feeling good about their contribution to my life. Um, they're not profiting in a financial way from, from doing the work with me. Uh, so... I think the biggest difference is just this pure alignment with my personal needs. And, and sometimes I end up in these hours, it's, it's Mark, it's not like every hour is, is productive when I'm with another person. Not at all. Sometimes I spend most of the time uh, being confused or not being able to figure out what I want to do. Uh, that's possible. And, and then after the hour, I, I tell my, my friend quite honestly, what, what happened and why it happened. And, even that is a moment of awareness, you know, exchanging that with another person to come to a conclusion of, oh, I guess I started by going on this side and that led me down this rabbit hole and, and now suddenly I couldn't do my work. That's a good moment of awareness and, and part of the journey. Like no, no journey is a straight shot up. We, we are always going to experience some setbacks and these little setbacks being discussed with a with a friend on the other side is just a beautiful way of connecting to each other and connecting to oneself. It sounds like it's really a great way to build new community, build new bonds and, and friendships and deepen those relationships. Um, mm -hmm. in, in some respects, you're absolutely right. What you said earlier, there's so many of us who really have these small communities, these little cliques that we work in, especially the youth, they, they have their decentralized little groups where they communicate very well. Um, and, and there's constantly new ones popping up. Um, I, I really want to get into some, some bigger questions here. So uh, that I want to know if you've thought about along the way, as I read your entire book, I give the overwhelming sense that you you care you care about the environment, you care about sustainability, but there's not a lot of direct talk except for a little bit with Taiwan where you come out and, and, and talk about it there. But it is how does that tie to technology? How does that tie to untethering and connecting back with nature? You do talk about that a little bit. Can you, can you tell me what? what that balance is. It's not work-life balance, but it's more like a, a, a connecting back to the world, the world, world around us. Yeah, totally. Uh, thanks for, for asking that question, Mark. I think that's extremely relevant in the times that we live in. Now, that being said, you know, my book is already 300 pages. So uh, to talk more about this would have meant to write a second book uh, and a third book, like the, maybe the environment, uh, environmental topics are, are even bigger than, uh, than the topics around being uh, or using technology too much or in, in ways that are not helpful to us. Um, I mentioned a little bit in our book, I think the, and, and maybe this is, this is kind of a good 
uh, intersection here to to uh, to to mention why this book is a, a little bit different than what I've uh, read before and what is out there. In in my book, I don't necessarily condemn technology in any way. I do mention that the average American spends over twelve hours connected to media every single day, um, and those 12 hours can be spent in extremely productive way that make us happy, that make us proud of our work. And they can be spent in extremely toxic ways where we're just trying to escape uh, some issues that we might have in real life. Um, now, th that being said, I think this book talks about technology as a very positive tool um, that comes with one downside that, which is it allows us to use it unconsciously. And, when when Americans are being asked about how much time they think they spend unconsciously with their devices, it's about 50% of their time. So if we're connected for over 12 hours, that's over six hours being spent unconsciously. If that was turned into uh, action, into, into um, alignment with ourselves, like one can be, become a millionaire in this country in a few years of six hours per day, right? That That is the reality that we live in. So it's, it, there's a, a lot of wasted potential and that wasted potential can be used for a lot of good uh, for some people it will be used to enrich themselves and for other people it will be used to enrich this world whether that's through culture whether that's through environmental action but we are basically wasting six hours per day unconsciously scrolling uh, unconsciously being on social media unconsciously watching something and consuming so for six hours we're just pure consumers, right? We're pure users of technology, but in, in passive ways. And I think there's just endless potential here. And I, I talk a little bit about environmentalism, but when I think about my book, I think about this idea of giving back six hours in a day. And, and, and when six hours are being used consciously, we all have different interests, but I'm sure these six hours, most of them is going to be positive action towards society and this world. And so I, I think the biggest thing we can do for ourselves and others is to start using technology in more conscious ways, because that will actually lead to the actions that you were talking about. Yeah, there are so there are so many things that you can do with those hours. And you do talk about meditation, you talk about it in a roundabout mm -hmm. way in a few other areas. So you touch a little bit on meditation, you touch a little bit about Taiwan, you also touch about connecting in nature and, um, yep. you know, a few other things. But that, uh, a, a, I deal with a lot of futurists, a lot of people in this space. And, and since the pandemic, it's really tripled online, more technology, more emails, more texting, more new uh, apps and services, um, different devices to be more efficient, to, to, to get, get things done. And that use of efficiency, I know people just in the pandemic, they've written two books. I know some that have written four books. I know some that right. have graduated with a degree, you know, an online degree. I know uh, some that have had a baby. So I know, know that only maybe takes a few minutes to an hour or, or less, right. but then nine months of gestation. Um, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do with that extra time captured and to, to the realization of that six hours. Uh, and even if you can get it to more day of what things you can learn a new language, you can learn where you're going to go travel or, or what you're going to do this, this it's endless that, um, that then change can change your future. I mean, just what you're doing with the book and what your journey, as you said, you've had these hard times, these experiences, you've worked for fabulous companies. Now you're going, you're writing the books and consulting and, and helping people in this, this direction uh, is, is enormous. There's one, one thing that I kind of want, want to touch about. So Sir Ken Robertson died uh, August 21st. 2020, one of the greatest educators uh, we ever had, and really is creating a new movement for education. Uh, our education system is broken, and, and right now, a lot of the solutions uh, that we're talking about, 
is what new technologies, what courses, how can we provide that online? During the beginning of the pandemic, I did the Earth School, uh, uh, these quests with uh, TED Education on, to drive kids to, you know, at their home, to their computers, half online, half offline, to kind of learn and be educated. Um, we really want to use new apps and technologies. And so I don't want to demonize technology. I don't want to demonize the apps or those companies because I think a lot of the solutions that we're looking for to change the system, to improve it, lies in, in these innovations, in these technologies. But we have to have that capstone course or that critical thinking around how to use it for our benefit so that it doesn't become our kryptonite. And that's what you so eloquently talk about in the, in the book, um, without me kind of giving too much away, what, what would you say the, that future is going towards for, for the youth and for humanity? And does it really lie with the step advance with how we think about it critically, how we understand it, how we kind of see it as a dual-edged sword or that kryptonite, or is it come afterwards with the way that technology like Tristan Harris is doing is kind of, how can we make technology that's more humane? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, I, I, I honestly think that both movements have their value. Um, on, on one hand, I think technology is constantly going to evolve. There's no like stopping technology from evolving is not, shouldn't even be our goal because uh, coming up with more efficient ways of doing what we're already doing is is something that technology provides us on a, on a daily basis. And we've seen it through the pandemic. We've all downloaded new apps and used new tools to connect with each other, mostly to connect with each other. But at the same time, we've also downloaded new tools to connect with ourselves, whether that's meditation apps um, or journaling apps these tools are out there as well. So at the end of the day, it's all about how do we use technology? Um, is it right to use technology 14 hours per day? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, probably 100 years ago before, um, uh, you know, before we had a ban on, on alcohol sales in the US, people were also wondering, is it okay to have five beer in an hour or in, in a day, right? It, it's, it's just hard because we don't have a real metric right now. Um, on alcohol, we know that that the blood, um, the the alcohol content in our blood is, is kind of the metric that we're using right now to evaluate uh, how much is still healthy for us and how much is good for us and, and how much we can drink to still be part of society. But right? we have defined that metric pretty clearly. Nobody tells us, uh, can I still drive a car after using Facebook for three hours? Like, these are real questions that we actually haven't answered for ourselves. Nobody tells me, oh, I can't game for 12 hours and then drive a car. I think it's extremely dangerous, right? But, but we don't have these metrics yet. And maybe even time isn't, isn't the right metric to, to use in the first place. Um, so that being said, I think technology can be used in any way that we want to use it. The complexity is going to increase. The choice is going to increase, so it's going to be harder to make the right choices here, and it's also going to be harder to have a reductionist approach, meaning how many hours do we want to dedicate to connecting with technology, and how many hours do we want to dedicate to connect with humanity and connect with ourselves, and how many of those hours do overlap? As we are having it right now, I think this is an overlap hour, right? Um, I think that that we need as a society to define healthy levels, not only for alcohol, not only for calories, not only for saturated versus unsaturated fats. There is an opportunity to define that for technology as well, and, and, and more specifically, the balance between technology and, and a more humane approach to life. There, there's this, uh, I, I'm, uh, like I said, I love technology. And, and so I've, I've found that balance. I use a lot of the tools that you discuss in your book and have, um, before they even existed, how to start setting boundaries or setting some, some guides mm -hmm. for me to, to make it work and function for me. That's, that's best. And, um, uh, yeah. 
I, I don't want to go into all those tips and tricks. I mean, you can tell I'm standing in front of the um, the computer right now speaking to right. you. I've been standing because I believe sitting is the new smoking and standing mm. is, is great. It has a different experience, but also technology around the places where you sleep, you touch upon that as well and things like that. Um, I, yeah, I really it's fascinating wanted, to me, Mark, yeah, that you uh, that you played a lot of of StarCraft as well, right? Because yeah. StarCraft is 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 a beautifully designed game, um, and I don't know if you've recently ever picked up a computer game. I after after playing StarCraft two, I kind of stopped gaming for for seven or eight years because I just couldn't handle what what games were giving me. But what's interesting to me is that. Uh, it's not necessarily the quality of games that are changing, not necessarily the quality of apps that are changing, um, but it is the, the ways they keep us engaged that is changing. Um, especially now that mobile games are becoming more and more popular. Um, I, I, I know for sure the storylines are not getting better, but I'm, th there is still a lot of um, addictive potential to these apps, more so than ever before, oh, yeah. because these uh gaming producers have figured out how to keep us engaged rather than provide unnecessary beautiful storylines to us and it's become less of an art and more of a tool of, of, of engagement and i think that's kind of that's really scary because when technology improves the quality of our lives it's it's just beautiful um, a great example of that for me is is meditation apps something that was so hard and unaccessible before has become uh, accessible for millions of people in in you know lighthearted and easy accessible ways um, but games have have gone the other direction they've said okay let's let's skip all the parts that have made this an art before how to create a storyline how to name these characters properly um, all of that has gone away and and now we have these like one click two click games that are super simplified but pe keep people engaged and and the gaming producers now know when to send us messages that are most likely to convert us into buyers of, of new heroes and new skins and, and so forth. Um, that's where I think uh, we're, we're making progress towards directions that are not helpful to us. But when technology increases the, the quality of its product or the quality of life, then that's just, that's just beautiful. It's, it's, it's actually very humane when... Uh, things like uh, meditation are becoming super available to us. I think that's just beautiful and connects us with ourselves and other people. Um, but how do, we, how do we know when that turns from creating new art to creating more engagement? I really think there's a delicate balance and, and I, I see it in, in the positive way. There's also this initial as, as certain technologies or certain new types of gaming, new types of apps start to emerge, um, there, I don't know if you would want to call it a learning curve, but there's this initial curve where you figure out what you don't want to get into or what you don't want to go down that road and, and how to make it work best for you. Uh, and to answer your question, yes, I, matter of fact, I've never never really stopped getting away from technology. The beautiful part for me is uh, I've always been a global citizen. I've always had family all around the world, but I haven't always lived in multiple places around the world at the you know, same time. So I've uh, in the early ages, as soon as it was available, just to have um, cheap telephone calls with my family overseas and then Skype and doing video calls to be able to see them has been fabulous. And I now it's just a commonplace thing. I can see my family and my business partners all around the world, which is mm -hmm. a fam fabulous thing. Currently in the Absolutely. gaming, uh, what I'm getting into more in gaming, and I, I see this shift in how, how gaming and those apps are going, um, I don't know if you've seen the Mandalorian or, or heard about mm -hmm. uh, that with Disney. They're pretty much epic games and using the Unreal Engine, and they're using these amazing rooms with uh, high definition screens and, and just doing these virtual backgrounds. But you could never tell that it's you know all virtual. It's done on this Unreal Engine. I just yep. I've had Epic Games for a long time in the Unreal Engine, but they just did this human 
creator, this new version where you can create a, a realistic looking replica of yourself or other human. And, and wow. I really want to com combine kind of a digital twin, you know, to, to experiment with AI and, and digital twins, not only for the earth and ecosystem, but as um, delivering and giving content in multiple times at the same place and getting a real time update right. on collective intelligence. And that's where we can get in the, the negative part where maybe a deep fake would be a direction where it would be go, go negative or where you could use it as a positive to spread information and education in a way that is still humane is still very helpful to those who don't have access to, to all the wonderful influencers in the world out there at every single moment uh, of the day. And so, um, but yeah, I, I, I really think there's always two sides to that coin. And the section that I, out of your book that I love the most is that whenever you talked about complexity and systems and how, how you know they are to give us better understanding and acceptance on that they exist and that that's okay and how we can be okay with that because um, and you mentioned this as well because there is this downgrading we try to oversimplify and that's where I get back to you know um, the the TED talk or the quick pitch or give me the short version. I don't right. have the time. Uh, uh, really, we have the time because we're spending 12 hours a day in front of our devices, which you said, but then they still want the short version so they can just consume more stuff that's probably not helping one's life. Whereas if we got into the depth and complexity in the systems of things, we'd realize, boy, this is powerful, wonderful tool same computing power that took man to the moon and now right. it's in the palm of my hand or it's in front of me and I can use it to get an education. I can use it to write a book or to advance myself. And that's what I see in your book. And I really, I enjoyed it. I, I appreciate you. It did give me some questions and I've asked you those. Um, the hardest question I have for you today is really the burning question, WTF. Uh, and it's not the swear word, although maybe you did ask yourself that during during these crazy times. It's what's the futures? Where are we going? What's what's the plan for for uh, that that we're on? And I really want to know it just for you. I don't expect you to tell us what it is for all humanity, but where are you going? What's the plan? What are the things you're working on? And, and uh, what's that journey look like? Yeah. So. Well, first part of this journey is obviously publishing this book. Um, and I'm very excited about that because I do think these, these 300 pages uh, contain a lot of valuable information, not only in terms of tools, but also our mindsets and, and just understanding the, the tech world a little bit better. Um, after that, it's the courses that I talked about, which I'm mega excited about. I think these are direct applications of some of the teachings in the book and, and are um, easier accessible for, for the youth, especially. Um, and after that, I, I am, or I'm actually already working on it, creating uh, simplified versions of the book that are accessible for, for this younger generation, whether that's uh, free downloads on my website or hopefully in future TikTok talks, that might be the most accessible way uh, for them. The, the last part is I, I talk about, or I think about community a lot. And I think that there is potential based on this, this untethered book to also create an untethered community of people who want to hold each other accountable, whether that's with their morning routine, whether that's with their work assignments, whether that's with uh, their relationship to their partners. Um, I, I'm thinking a lot about how to create this community of people who want to help each other create win-win situations, be accountable, make themselves and others feel better through this process. Um, because I, at, the, at the end of the day, I believe when we feel good, we take right actions more often. And when we feel bad, we take uh, toxic actions more often. And our smartphone is just a representation of how we feel. Right? If, we, if we try to escape uh, problems we have in real life, then it's very easy to open YouTube, to open Netflix, um, and, and just be a consumer of that information. But when we feel good, when we feel helpful, when we feel engaged, uh, our smartphones open up a whole new world for us to express that engagement, to express that interest of helping each other. 
Um, and so I think the, the, the kind of future part of this journey for me is to create a community of, of untethered creators who want to help each other uh, be accountable and, and be the best version of themselves. Are, are you hopeful and optimistic for our future? Um, I mean, I'm extremely hopeful and optimistic for our future because if we can uh, change so much in just 13 years since, since the iPhone came out, I, I, think, I think we have endless potential to change and adopt. And, and we can already see that with the youngest generation. For example, millennials use their phone more than the generation that comes after, although we think of them as the, the most addicted generation. They're not truly, not, not if we look at data. Um, and, and some scientists believe that their reduced attention spam is just a, a way of uh, analyzing or it's, it's a natural consequence to an overload of information. And so they adjust it by being able to faster comprehend what's behind information. So we call it like a, a uh, shorter attention span, but it might just be a, a further development of humanity that allowed them, uh, that is a consequence of their ability to analyze information more quickly than we are. So there's a positive spin to this. And I, and I truly believe that there is some truth to it. So I think humanity is changing at a faster rate than ever before. I think we'll realize what uh, the downsides of technology use are and how we can use it to our benefits. Not everybody, there was definitely going to be a divide between people who use technology in conscious and aware ways to, to be creators on those platforms and then uh, the side of consumers and, and a more passive engagement with technology. Yeah, you also address that as well, that there's uh, actually too many choices and I feel that as well, there's uh, too many choices and not just in technology and apps and things that, that, that we have that it becomes information overload. I, I, at the end, uh, you, you throughout, you really give us a lot of hope. It's a wonderful read. And then your nine super um, tips, tricks, uh, things that you can apply to untether to really uh, turn that kryptonite into your superpower and, and to use it for good and gain back a lot of time and, and abilities. I love the book. I only have three more questions for you left and they're uh, selfish they're selfish they're for my listeners if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life what would it be your message mm. wow distilling everything in in one sentence huh that's that's no you could to do it. <laughs> say it a couple of things that's fine um no i i think if, if there was one thing that uh, I would love people to take away from this book is the power of, uh, of working together. You know, I think there's so much power in, in being responsible for another person. We're so good at being responsible for our pets, right? Why don't we, why don't we do a better job at being responsible for each other? Um, I think there's a lot of beauty in that. And I think it's, it's also at the spirit of our time, which is this um, continuously developing connection that we feel towards each other over the internet. Um, a conversation like we're having right now would probably not have happened just just five years ago even you know so I think there's a beautiful way of connecting with other with, with other humans we have the tools to do it and we have the desire to help each other so the the biggest uh, takeaway and, and change in our approach to life is ask for help and offer help I think that's that's so powerful I love that what should young innovators in your field maybe who had tech and were involved in electric vehicles and things be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Mm. Well, I, I think one of the most critical skills uh, for, for younger people is knowing how to program, not necessarily knowing how to program in all languages and being an expert at it, but there is a mindset behind programming that is unique. And, and the way that I can best describe this is, you know, I spend most of my life in, in hardware companies and, and Apple, you know, is probably a hybrid of, of hardware and software, but hardware companies, uh, they, they, uh, their main focus is redundance and perfection because especially with cars, it's, it's 10,000 parts coming together in one product. Um, if you mess up a few of those parts, 
the car might not be able to function properly or it, it doesn't look the way that we want it to look or it's not um, it's not going to last for 5, 10, 15 years. So there is a big interest in, in hardware companies to get it right immediately and have redundancy in case systems fail, right? Uh, in software, there's a very different approach to how we think about creation. Um, and I think it's a much more human approach to creation, meaning a programmer knows that the only way to get to that goal is by constantly failing at making that goal happen. Um, and in hardware, it's much more, well, we have all those tools necessary to calculate the physics behind this product and we'll have zero errors when it comes out. That's our goal. Um, with software, that's not actually the goal. There's a lot of user testing involved. There's a lot of errors even when a product comes out, but our ability to iterate and get those errors out quickly is actually a way of thinking about the world, meaning um, if I start working with an accountability body, I know that we don't necessarily know how to work with each other initially and we'll make some mistakes. But as we make these mistakes, we'll develop as humans and we'll make it better throughout. And that's kind of a software way of thinking about the world. And I think every young person should understand what, what software developers know, which is making errors is progress, right? Making errors doesn't make us a bad human. Errors don't actually exist if, if you like, if you are thinking about it philosophically, failure doesn't exist because failure is part of success. And so failure is actually success to a certain degree. Um, so yeah. You might've answered this last question uh, with that answer. What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Journey so far is life or journey of writing this book? Uh, life, really. Hmm. What do I mean? What hmm. was it? Boy, I wish I would have learned that earlier. Or uh, a lot of people say um, yeah. they they say it's the journey itself. I, I really needed that to because it, it taught me so much. But sometimes people say, "Oh, yeah, I learned this." Um. Well, I think the the first thing that comes to mind is perfection doesn't exist. Right, all of our journeys are so individual. However, during um, during educational during this phase of education as a young adult, we're being taught that perfection exists. You can get a hundred score, you can have A's in all your classes. Perfection is is an illusion created by our educational institutions, and so when we come out of it, we still strive for it. But the first moment we you know we don't get accepted. Uh, for a certain position or fail at work, we realize, hey, perfection is not actually something that we should be striving for. I think it's very toxic to strive for perfection. So that's something I wish I had known 10, 15 years ago that striving for perfection would not make me happy. But what would make me happy is striving for, um, for, for achieving my own desires, for living out my values. That makes me happy. I wish I had written this book five, 10 years ago, but I was still in this mindset of, I need to achieve in this world and I need to perform at the highest level. Um, and I think that's that's counterproductive because what we truly need is people who live out their values, people who live out their dreams. Um, the biggest achievements of humanity all come from people who actually made their dreams happen. Um, that's what we need. And I think our smartphones are making that accessible to a degree that was never never there before like if i if i tell this to my grandparents they would laugh at me because they just didn't have the opportunities to to do whatever they truly wanted to do and and i'm not saying that most of humanity has that ability right now that that is certainly not true but i think as every year passes there's a bigger percentage of hum humanity who has the privilege to actually make their dreams happen and when we have that privilege, I think it's kind of our duty to go after it. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I have for you. Awesome. Unless there's something, I mean, we missed a lot. Your, your book's uh, big. I could go into all the beautiful little stories you tell, but I don't want to give too much of it away. Is there anything that we missed that you want the audience to know or listeners to know that we didn't get a touch upon? 
No, Mark, I think this was this was amazing. I, I super, super appreciate this conversation. Um, obviously, if the, the readers or listeners uh, want to know more, they can go on my homepage. It's askcini.com um, or uh, www.theunpetteredbook.com. They can find out more. Um, I'll let them know when the book comes out and when I'm able to create that community and when the course comes out. So I, I hope uh, your listeners will, will take advantage of that. Yeah, I'll put all all your links in the show description and uh, drive everybody there. I highly recommend it and uh, give us give us some different audio ebook, short versions, long versions, so that we can get mm -hmm. it out as many people as possible. Cindy, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fabulous. Thank Thanks for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure, and hope we can catch up on your next book or to find out how what the resonance is as it comes out on launch. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye.